for Action San Gabriel Valley Chapter. Uh, organizing for Action is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that was created to help advance the agenda that the American people voted for in 2012. And climate change is obviously a very huge component of that agenda. So today, we organize a very prestigious manner of speakers uh, with a wide uh, diversity of um, ideas and backgrounds to talk to you about solutions for climate change to help us come up with an actual game plan regarding how to tackle climate change. So before we begin, I just wanted to have a few housekeeping items. One, please make sure everyone turns off their cell phones. I'm sure you all know that. And the second thing is the exits in case of some emergency are that door over there, that door over there, and that door over there. So uh, let's begin with our first speaker, who is David Chris, the senior research assistant over at Depopolitan Laboratory. <laughs> Scientist, sorry. <laughs> That'd be good. And he is going to be talking about um, the urgency of climate change um, from the perspective of how it's seen from space. So, thank you very much. And yes, I was a research assistant once. Uh, how many topics about students do you have? Guys, we have a little bit of visionary work to do. I can't see it. Okay, I'm going to get to the next one. And so, my perspective on our system today is going to be very exciting. I'm going to talk a little bit about the kind of people that are some of the issues that we're seeing. Those of us at KBL and NASA in general, we're kind of like doctors with this episode from the moment we're trying to test and help the patient understand its, its uh, behavior and evidence over time, uh, and, and try to understand how it affects the FBI and the uh, behavior. As you'll see towards the end of my presentation, if not very early, uh, yep. uh, my generation is going to tell that down and say, we all want to change the world. We did. <laughs> 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 and we're seeing all kinds of changes in our environment. And some of the questions we have to ask ourselves is how uh, broad are these procedures? How pervasive are they? And how are they in the health? Uh, 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 Observing our planet from space as well as from the ground. And what are we saying? Just about everywhere we're looking, we're finding things like melting glaciers. We're seeing dramatic retreats in grace pleasures, where this is, a, this is a, an image taken early in the 20th century, and this is at the end of the 20th century. And what's going on is this. Glaciers are melting all over the world. We know that. Permafrost is melting. If you live in Alaska, if you live in Fairbanks, uh, your house may disappear uh, into a, a, a pile of mud that used to be as hard as concrete as the permafrost that it was hidden on hills. We're seeing dramatic droughts, and especially in the, in the uh, southeast of the US, uh, uh, in places like Texas, uh, droughts that we haven't seen the likes of since uh, the Great Dust Bowl of the 1930s. We're seeing more fire. This is my backyard. This is JPL. This was fire back a few years ago at the call. These are actually becoming not just more common. We are seeing them more often from, from space-based observations and so forth, but they are actually becoming quite, quite a bit more common. We're seeing sea level rise. Uh, sea level is not rising so fast that you can watch it, but when somebody gives you a metric and says the sea level is rising, rising by more than a millimeter per year, I think it's time to get some attention. And that's coming primarily from the melting glaciers. We're seeing dramatic deforestation as we monitor the earth from above and also locally. Uh, basically, to, to support uh, increased farming, uh, also to provide wood products. So lots of things going on. Superposed on all of this, we're seeing lots of severe weather, uh, floods, uh, dramatic storms across the world. How common is that? The answer is very much so, and in all, of these, all of these things are increasing over time as we're seeing the temperatures rise uh, and climate change. What's going on here? We all pretty much know. Human beings, since the beginning of the Industrial Age, have been burning fossil fuels, also wood, biomass, and also making changes in the way that we use land. And all of these processes are dumping carbon dioxide into our atmosphere. 
Over the last two years, we've been dumping on the order of 35 billion tons of carbon dioxide into our atmosphere every single year. That's enough to raise the carbon dioxide abundance of our atmosphere by 1% per year. That is a lot. In fact, it's not, though. The climate system has been absorbing half of all of that carbon dioxide we've been dumping in for as long as we've been making measurements. We don't know why, we don't know where, and we don't know for how much longer you're expecting to keep that paper. But this may, you may have heard a lot of, of reports, we're now basically seeing carbon dioxide abundances near 400 parts per million. That's 400 out of every million molecules in the atmosphere is now a carbon dioxide molecule. And that's just a number for some of us, but I want to point out that's the highest number we have seen in the entire ice core record over the last 800,000 years. Can you imagine what the Earth was like 800,000 years ago? Worse than that, other evidence seems to indicate that this may, this may be the highest level of the CO2 abundance we've seen in the atmosphere it, since, since, since the Pliocene. That was 4 million years ago. How long ago was 4 million years ago? What was going on back then? Well, let me tell you. If you had a sister 4 million years ago, her name would have been Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> we weren't even walking completely upright. And we certainly weren't human beings we know today. That was a long time. So what's really going on there? We've been dumping carbon dioxide into our atmosphere at amazingly large rates by burning fossil fuels primarily and other practices that I've already mentioned. That's caused the carbon dioxide abundance of the atmosphere to rise. Carbon dioxide is a very, very effective atmosphere greenhouse gas. And guess what? If you dump enough of this stuff into the atmosphere, you can make a real difference. And what we're actually now seeing is that difference in surface temperatures as they rise in response to this extra greenhouse gas that was up in there. So the carbon emissions have increased, the atmosphere concentrations are increasing, and the temperature have been, temperatures have been increasing pretty much as we expected. Now, temperatures. Very interesting story on that. This is the temperature record uh, annual, on a, a smooth by on a over annual cycle. Uh, uh, since this is 1850, and this is us over here. And you might notice there are bumps and wiggles, but the main trend we've seen recently is an upward trend. Do you all agree? It's kind of basically an upward trend. Now, there is a little bit of a, a it stopped uh, it wasn't quite as fast in the last few years as it had been in the, in the latter part of the last century, and it kind of had a little bit of what has been known as, it comes to be known as the pause. Okay? A lot of people have said, well, yeah, greenhouse gases, uh, greenhouse gases have obviously stopped increasing the temperature, and global change has stopped now. Is that your, is that your conclusion here? If we average those numbers over, and over that digital cycle, or over 10-year cycles, we still find that over the last 10 years, it's been the hottest 10 years on record ever. Okay? Things have been going up. And where is all the heat from the greenhouse warming going if, if in fact, it isn't going into causing the surface temperature of the Earth to rise? Well, it's actually not a surprise to any of us who have been studying the climate for a long time. We've known for a long time that uh, over 90% of the heating due to greenhouse warming is going into the ocean. The ocean, unlike the atmosphere, has a tremendous heat capacity. And you can dump a lot of lots of energy into the ocean without changing its temperature enough to even measure. But it's changed enough that we're now able to measure. It's just a few hundreds of a degree of centigrade that we've gone up over the last 10 years. But it's enough to pick up and to really clearly see. But if you want other evidence that the, that the heat has been going into the ocean, Look at sea level rise. Sea level rise is due to two factors. First of all, we melt glaciers and dump more water into the ocean. That causes sea level rise. But a significant fraction, over a third of the sea level rise we're seeing, is just due to the fact that when you heat up water, it expands. <coughs> and we're seeing this is the last 10 years. We've seen the oceans expand and sea level rise increase faster than we have ever seen it in the past. We've got a problem here in the sense that a lot of factors are pointing to CO2-induced climate change, leading to potentially dramatic changes in our environment. Now, uh, 
I, I'm just a scientist. I'm not going to save the world and, and, and be able to uh, actually fix all of these problems, but I can at least tell you what they're doing for our system. And to do that, you first of all have to understand uh, and predict uh, how we might change, we might actually uh, be changing our climate and our environment. We also then have to understand how natural processes and systems are responding to these changes. That's what our job is. And we've been doing the best job we can given the good, really relatively limited resources we have to do this job. Ground-based measurements are ideal for finding kind of global trends in the system. This is just showing the, the keeling curve of carbon dioxide built up in the atmosphere over time. And we can tell that from a single measurement made in, at Mauna Loa. But you don't want to really see how the system is operating and where the carbon dioxide is coming from and where it's going to. You need to go to space and make space-based measurements over the entire world. Because we can only manage what we can measure. You wouldn't want a surgeon to do a surgery on you with a blindfold on it, where the, where the eyes are used. So, for more information on what we're trying to do, we've got a, a, over a dozen satellites up there looking at the Earth right now uh, to try to understand this stuff in a global context. You can learn more about what we're doing by looking at this website. I would encourage you to go here and take a look around and find out what we are and, and can learn about our environment from space and from ground-based measurements. I thank you all for your attention. Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Roberta Fresco. I work with Jeff in Organizing for Action. The agenda for the rest of the panel discussion is this picture. And I'm going to tell you the whole story really fast now first. Step one, um, we're going to talk about a climate game plan that we think can begin to, to address the crisis created by climate change. The game plan requires action, successful action, by several entities. Number one, and there's a, there's a here. Number one is government. We need good stuff from our government. Government has a role to fund high risk and potentially very high reward research. The government has a role to invest in ideas that are just too risky for private investors. So whether it's funding from the government or from private investors or industry, investment in research and innovation is a key component of our game plan. And then number two, in the market, government has a role to enact legislation. Whether it's mandates or price supports or taxes, we're going to talk today about legislation that can enable the market for alternate energy sources. Step three, is the community, the community organizations. As more technologies and products come to market, community organizations have a role to play. Community organizations can provide leadership and education. Often there are trade-offs that the public needs to understand, whether it's between different technologies or different types of legislations. And we look to community groups, often nonprofit ones, to step up and help guide us. So the game plan on the first half of the circle includes players and actions that help to expand the use of alternate clean energies. But of course, the strategy is not complete without conservation. So we do talk conservation. Uh, we talk individuals and conservation. And with the whole circle in play, we have synergy. And I do apologize for using a word that was popular in the last century. But when all of these entities contribute, we could have a win. So as dedicated as we all are, we can't sit here long enough to cover everything that's being done in all of these areas, or to talk about all the players at all levels, whether it's international or global or federal or city or state or whatever. So today the plan is to focus on just a selection of activities close to home that we do right here in Southern California. Because we figure if we do it right here, we can be the role model for the U.S., maybe for the whole world. For speakers, for speakers, we have experts who can speak to an example of something that's happening in each of these areas. Each speaker today is part of a team that's already doing something. So that's why we figure we will be going beyond the rhetoric, because our plan is to talk about examples of real solutions that are uh, taking place now. Now my last comment 
on, on the agenda is that all of these actions can happen at the same time. Um, they don't have to take place in this order just because we drew arrows on it. Um, we could have really done the whole program backwards if we wanted. But today, we're going to go clockwise. And that's, that's pretty much it. Uh, I have, we're going to have two question and answer sessions. Uh, when you guys came in, you should have gotten index cards. And if a question comes up, please write it down. Our yeah, plan is there. to just uh, collect cards along that aisle. Uh, between the talks, you can just pass them over. And um, at right, right at the midpoint, and at the end, we'll go through questions and answers. We'll have a break. There are refreshments out in the lobby. You can't bring the food in here. But you can eat it out there. And um, if you haven't seen them, there are a lot of community groups with tables outside uh, for the little bit of the break and afterwards. So at the end, when we get uh, through the panel part, we do have a tour of JCAP, which is the Joint Center for Artificial Flows and this is here at Caltech. Um, it's one of the talks this morning, this afternoon. And uh, we'd like to know, if you're interested in going, please put your name on the sheet. If you didn't do that when you walked in, just do that in the break. Because we need to get a head count. Uh, there's only a certain number of people can fit in the lab. So we want to plan for that. How long is that tour? Uh, we think it could be about 40 minutes. Our plan is to walk from here over there, which takes 10 minutes, and maybe another 30 in the lab. <coughs> so let's start. And we'll start with step one. Step one in our game plan is a role for government and money. We have such a complex and critical challenge, as we do with carbon pollution and climate change, that we have an opportunity to put money into a really big technological advancement. Ideally, an investment in science could bring us a clean, a new, clean, renewable, and very low-cost fuel that would be the greatest thing since sliced bread. We would have an economic windfall. It could position the United States as a world leader in energy technology. So funding, <coughs> funding is such an investment in research is not all that easy to do. Um, you know, aside from all the risks, you have to find the right talented research team to work with. But good news, we are here at Caltech. <laughs> and we have an excellent example for this first next talk. Department of Energy, uh, one more. Department of Energy has uh, helped to fund an innovation hub, the Joint Center for Artificial Photosynthesis. And Nate Lewis is here who is the uh, Ajiro's Professor of Chemistry, and he's also the Scientific Director at JCAP, the Joint Center for Artificial Intelligence. <coughs> I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the climate issue as a give you insight into what we're trying to do as one of the things, long-term things on Caltech, to add to the ability of technology to give us better choices. It's not our ability to predict that's the problem. In fact, it's our inability to predict that is the problem. We know this is no thing as you saw. Here are the predictions of the rate of summer sea ice melt. And then, after those worst case predictions were made, here's the data that show it melts more rapidly than the worst case predictions. None of the climate models have in them the so-called runaway train effects. These non-linear effects when, for instance, the permafrost, which is melting now in areas that hasn't melted in 40,000 years, when the white ice turns melted and dark, it absorbs more sunlight that then gets warmer, that then turns more ice melted, that then darkens it. There isn't enough carbon there to change the atmospheric levels by a factor of two. There's enough to change it by a factor of ten. We know this happened at least once before, 230 million years ago in the Permian era, when there was a rapid release of this light isotopic carbon. We know temperatures rose by 6 degrees on average centigrade, 12 at the poles. We know that 80% of the species on Earth then alive could not adapt and went extinct. We know we are changing the carbon levels at a rate more rapidly now than even in that era. We also know that there is no credible way to get rid of the 600 trillion pounds of CO2 that will be in our air by then. 
and you know it lasts for two time constants. One is to dissolve the CO2 into the oceans and mix in the oceans. And the next is to take what's in the oceans and make it into the carbonate rocks, where most of the carbon is on our planet. And the first one would take the carbon, if we quit cold turkey and never burnt another drop of oil cold gas again, our planet would get back to the one that we got from our parents in 500 years, three quarters of the way, and the rest would take 10,000 years. And nobody has a credible way of avoiding that time constant. So this is not a problem when you can stop 40 years from now and then say, well, I fixed the problem then to change the atmosphere for a time scale comparable to human history. <coughs> and we don't know how to predict what we will give to our children's children's children as a result. We do know, in addition to the observed carbon levels in the atmosphere, that actually Part of the reason not all the carbon goes into the atmosphere is according to the law of chemistry, as everybody that's ever drank soda knows, the carbon, when you dissolve CO2 in water, you make it acidic. In fact, most of that carbon that is going into the air goes into our near-surface ocean, where it doesn't mix with the deep oceans that cross the thermal climb there. And we know that we, we acidify the ocean because of that. The pH of the oceans is lower now than it has been in 4 million years and probably in 20 million years. 20% 20 of the coral is currently bleached. Most of the climate, just pH models say that within our lifetimes, essentially all of it will be on its way to bleaching. Um, I gave my kid a movie DVD of Finding Nemo and told him to hang on to it because it will probably be the only place that we will see colored coral for the next 10,000 or more years, which is how long it takes to undo the ocean acidification, which we know from volcanic eruptions that did it earlier on our planet. This is simply an experiment that we are doing, the biggest experiment with our planet, that we get to do or not exactly once. When you come to a fork in the road, you just have to take it. Well, what's the worst? What does the world's energy meter read right now? The world's energy reader needs 15 trillion watts. You can't solve this problem with changing a few light bulbs in Fresno. You can't solve this problem with a few nuclear reactors that each make a billion watts. In fact, if you wanted to replace the 15 trillion watts that we now use with nuclear power, which could be a scalable low-carbon technology, <coughs> you would have to build a new nuclear power plant every single day for the next 40 straight years. Oh, and by the way, since they only last 40 years, then you would have to keep building them forever. But if you don't do that, you would have to do a million solar roofs every single day forever. And if you don't do that, you have to go down the list of where can I get 15 or 20 trillion watts. You can't get it from the wind. You can't get it from the tides. You can't get it from geothermal. You can't get it from biomass from the fastest growing plant if you want to feed people. The only place you can get it is that the sun gives us 120,000 terawatts. And we need 10 more. Well, why don't we just put up solar panels? A, because they're relatively expensive, but more importantly, uh, President Gerald Ford actually had it right in 1974 when he said solar energy just isn't something that's going to come in overnight. You cannot build a reliable energy system out of an intermittent resource. We have to find a way to take the biggest energy source known to mankind, the sun, and store it in the most dense form known to mankind, other than the nucleus of an atom, which is chemical fuels. To give you a feeling for just how much better chemical storage is than any other storage, we store electricity right now by pumping water uphill. Well, you can do that if you want to store the energy in one gallon of gasoline, you have to pump 55,000 gallons of water up the height of Hoover Dam. One to 55,000. If you want to store energy in batteries, you can take all the batteries built in human history and they'll power our country for seven minutes. 
The best battery has an energy density of 200 watt hours in a kilogram. Gasoline is 12,000. You don't have to know anything more to know why we have range problems in electric vehicles. And why it would be good if someone figured out a way to take the biggest energy source we have, the sun, and store it in chemical bonds and chemical fuel. This is an inevitable technology. Someone's going to do it someday. It's the only way we can see to solve the two big challenges in a sustainable energy future, which are massive grid storage. So when the sun goes out, when the wind doesn't blow, we have that energy wherever and whenever we need it. And high energy density fuels for transportation. Because no matter how much electricity we make, there ain't no such thing as a plug-in hybrid airplane. And 40% of the global transportation, aircraft, ships, and heavy-duty trucks that cannot be electrified. Okay. So why don't we try to make fuel directly from the sun? Why should you know how to do that? Plants do it. They get a B minus. Their efficiency is very low. Less than 1% of the sunlight that hits an acre over a year goes into the energy stored in the fastest growing plant. You all know this. How far do you think you can go if you took what you got by mowing your lawn every day and put it in your car? <laughs> Not very. <laughs> you know, it's a green waste though, right? So we can do better. There are minerals like this. And that actually, we had the movie, which we don't in that, this PC conversion, would be making hydrogen gas from light already in an energy efficiency that would be greater than that of the fastest growing plant. Now, we don't want hydrogen as a fuel, but if you have clean, cheap hydrogen, you can use it to convert it to gasoline. And so that's no problem. <coughs> What's the real issue? The real issue is that it doesn't look like something that we could roll out, nor is that material give us the three things that we really need. We want it to be cheap, we want it to be robust, and we want it to be efficient. And right now, we can give you two but not the third at the same time. You might want cheap and efficient, that's good, it won't last. You might want cheap and last, that's good, it's not efficient. You might want efficient and last, I'll give you that too, but it's not cheap. So our job in JCAP is to do the basic research and development to do all three at once. Unlike a plant, which isn't designed very well because there are two chlorophylls and they're the same color. And so you don't get all the colors of the rainbow and the top chlorophyll filters some of the sunlight from getting down to the bottom. You actually want materials that absorb the blue, so they look red, and the materials that absorb the red separately that go through that one, so they look blue. And instead, you also want the material uh, that's flexible, that can be rolled out like a piece of plastic. And on top of that, you want to make the fuel that you just wick out by collecting something in your yard, except that it looks kind of like a slip and slide or a high performance fabric, and you wick out your product. So we are working on systems that have the potential to give us a choice, in addition to the ones that we have now, that can help make a clean energy system affordable and deployable for everyone. This is not to say that there are not steps that we should be taking in the interim like conserving energy like our lives depend on it, because they probably do, right? Like changing our light bulbs, like making choices in high energy electric vehicles versus gasoline ones, like installing solar panels on your roof to make carbon neutral energy. But no matter what you do, you can't get across the Grand Canyon of building a clean energy system unless you solve the two big problems, which are massive bridge storage and carbon neutral transportation fuels. And we do that both in principle at once. This is a not small effort. It was nationally competed. There were 20 teams that proposed that. The Caltech team, which is now uh, joint with Lawrence Berkeley Lab, 150 people of chemists, material scientists, chemical engineers, all working on this problem. We are the Wright brothers. We just have to get off the ground. This is not a commercial technology. It's not even close. You can't build a 747 until you know it's possible to fly without feathers. That's our job. <laughs> the next five years is to go faster, better, cheaper. Um, this project is funded at $25 million a year. Uh, we're working very hard to justify that to the nation and the world. Um, there are also now partner copycat efforts. There's the weird JCAT. 
There's JJCAT, the Japanese Center for Artificial Photosynthesis. The CCAT, the Chinese Center. There's BCAT, the Brazilian Center. There's ECAT, the European Center. There's the Israeli Center. And of course, they all want to send people to learn how we're doing it. And we're delighted to share at the same time. We have to run faster and run better than everybody else, which is exactly what I trust our American people to innovate and do. If you want more details, I'm happy to give you the tour and, of course, answer more technical questions. Thanks very much.